Um, our next speaker is Katie Murray. She was here last week. Many of you uh, met her, I guess not last week, a couple of weeks ago. And she's giving us uh, grand rounds today. Katie, go ahead and uh, feel free to intro yourself and, um, and speak to us. Sure, great. Thanks so much for having me. Um, you guys can all hear me, right? Looks like, okay. Um, uh, again, thanks for the invitation. I had a great time. Um, I guess it has been nearly two weeks ago now. And and like um, Dr. Rodriguez said, I, I met several of you and so had the opportunity to talk about lots of different things. And uh, I'm going to follow up with a, a short presentation this morning and answer any questions and, and hopefully make this conversational if able. So I'm going to uh, share share screen here. Maybe. There we go. Okay, I think you guys can probably screen see my screen now. Um, and so uh, I am currently an associate professor of, of urology. Um, I'm a urologic oncologist at uh, the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri. Um, and I'm just going to be talking about kind of finding a niche, not that not that I'm, I'm there yet, uh, but making next steps um, and some upper tract urothelial carcinoma um, and quote unquote more treatments that are out there. Um, so disclosures, I have been a consultant and speaker. Um, and so, you know, I, I start this by uh, telling a little bit about uh, my history and, and where things are. So I was a, a resident at the University of Kansas, and then I did a fellowship at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering that I finished in 2016. And, um, and then I uh, came as uh, faculty to the University of Missouri, and uh, we're a small institution. And one of the first things that uh, I realized based on my previous training was, is I absolutely needed to collaborate um, and I needed to find something and, and try to find a place where I belonged um, in the world of urology. And, and I think that's a tough thing for so many of us and, and we have ideas in our minds, but where that actually plays out um, can change over time. Um, in finding that. And so, you know, something that I realized is now I've been out of practice um, six years and kind of looking back and thinking back uh, that I feel like just now everything is starting to uh, to come to fruition a bit and, and things, everything takes time, right? That's, that's, that's what we learn in residency as well. Uh, we learn it throughout our entire lives that we must be patient. And one of the other things that I that I'm going to kind of go through as we talk about upper tract urothelial carcinoma um, is how important those connections are in urology and you know something that I have done for myself and the reason I've met several of you people is um, everybody there is uh, to introduce yourself introduce yourself many many times and everywhere you go uh, you never know when that opportunity is and so you know I, I say this also to uh, the sub eyes that are out there that just gave uh, presentations because this becomes such a huge part of your career going forward um, and sometimes it's a tough thing to do but if you make a conscious effort it's possible uh, so uh, enough of life lessons uh, and urological lessons in the world of urology so uh, let's switch and, and talk about something that we all want to learn about and um, ask more questions about, and that's about urology, right? And more specifically, let's talk about upper tract urothelial cell carcinoma, um, right? We all know who these patients are and what these patients look like, um, and sometimes the difficulties in treating these individuals. We want to get those first pictures where patients have these uh, tumors, whether they be small, whether they be bulky, um, and we want them to, go, to look good. Um, in the end, we want to do a good thing for our patients in the end of everything that we do. So upper tract uh, urothelial carcinoma, you know, interestingly, as urologists, I think that we see this, um, or especially in urologic oncology, we don't 
realize on a daily basis as uh, the rarity of this disease. And it is considered in the big world um, of cancers uh, as a rare disease. It count, accounts for five to 10% of patients with urothelial carcinoma, right? So a sub, a very small portion of those patients that we see with urothelial carcinoma um, or i.e. bladder cancer. Um, incidence is about two per 100,000 in Western countries. Um, concurrent bladder cancer and, and, you know, a fifth of those patients, about 20, 25% of patients is what I will, will discuss with patients. Um, but recurrence rates after somebody has upper tract urethelial, of course, um, those recurrence rates within the bladder can be much, are quoted at much higher. You know, I'll tell somebody up to 40 to 50% nearly um, uh, thereafter. Um, on the flip side, um, of those patients that we see with bladder cancer and our guidelines tell us that we should continually be monitoring their upper tracts. Um, you know, we're talking two to four um, percent. Maybe that's higher. Maybe it's underdiagnosed of bladder cancer patients who have or who will have a metaphorous upper tract uh, urethelial. Um, but a little bit on the flip side of bladder cancer, and again, you know, sometimes these diagnoses are hard to make, um, but 60% of patients who have de novo upper tract disease um, are identified to have invasive disease at the time of initial diagnosis. So one thing that I think is, is really challenging and something that's so important for us is in today's world, there's uh, you know, the internet, not just the internet, there's YouTube, there is, uh, gosh, there's TikTok, there's Instagram, there's so much information on the internet for patients. And so one thing that I'm very clear with when I talk to patients about upper tract disease is you do not have kidney cancer, right? Because they immediately go and they start Googling kidney cancer. Um, you know, and get to, to some of the kidney cancer guidelines, and that can really confuse things for ourselves and um, uh, our patients. But it's also not bladder cancer, right? And and I I make this mistake trying to simplify things for my patients all the time as well. Um, and, and it does sometimes can allow them to understand, but if you look here at kind of some of the differences between bladder um, urethelial carcinoma and upper tract urethelial carcinoma, one of the first things that we immediately see is the differences in how much it's been studied um, over the years, right? There's a gazillion studies and papers out there and trials on bladder, um, but not as much on upper tract. Um, of course, a little bit of a, a gender differences, and and then we you know talk about some of the uh, the biggest ones being hereditary diseases that will will pop up in our minds that we should be thinking about with upper tracts uh, more so than bladder. Um, intracavitary treatment. We've known for how many years that uh, putting treatments directly into the bladder has. Uh, you know, most urologists and people in training in today's world, that is common sense. Um, and historically in upper tract disease, that's been a huge anatomic barrier uh, as there's been no way to, to physically make that happen. Lymphadenectomy at the time of surgery and bladder, we know that what this is, we know about uh, standard and extended lymph node dissections in upper tract disease that's been left, left less clear um, and then, of course, uh, molecularly um, uh, uh, for these, these patients, huge population of FGFR3 um, mutations, and these are, uh, for the most part, luminal compared to basal and bladder. So risk stratify, right? So let's, so I'm going to focus here on low risk uh, upper tract urethelial carcinoma, and this is something that in the United States, we don't talk about very well, or we don't um, articulate very well. We talk very much so in gradings. We do low grade and high grade. Um, and there is, uh, of course, there's a huge difference in gradings of low grade and high grade for, for any urethelial carcinoma. Um, but what we should really be thinking about is, as the European uh, guidelines have laid this out, is this low risk upper tract disease. And what is that? 
if patients, of course, who are low grade, right, they have a negative urine cytology, they have a ureterostaphic biopsy that confirms low grade, they have no appearance of invasiveness on CT urography, they have smaller tumor size, not that tumor you get in and it's just filling the whole renal you know, pelvis or, or all the calyces. Um, or those patients with unifocal disease, right? That's in contrast to those that we should consider quote unquote high risk, which is essentially the opposite of all of the things I just described. Uh, and this is this is important. And the biggest driver of that, and I say in the United States, we've always talked in grading, low grade, high grade, right? Now this is this is an older study that, that breaks those down to, to, to the older system of grade one, grade two, grade three. But basically, the top is a progression free survival. Bottoms are disease specific survival for upper tract urethelial carcinoma um, of patients undergoing endoscopic management and nephrodic redirection. All you have to do is really glance at these to see. Um, the grade matters, right? So there is a difference, and if we can reliably uh, identify those low grades and low risk disease, that's important for us. So just like everything in uh, urology, uh, treatment should be based on our risk. Um, low risk diseases should not uh, equal aggressive interventions. We tr should try to um, help patients. Obviously, we want to have good oncologic outcomes, but at the same time, we don't want to impact the rest of their life. We don't want to impact their other comorbidities and other things. So what does that mean for low risk upper tract urethelial? It means that we need to try to save kidneys when possible. Right? This is also not a new concept uh, to urologists. This has been, been for quite some time. So why, when, and how? does that happen, right? Why should we do this, right? We could, could ask all the, the students in the room and ask everybody, why do we want to save kidney? Why is that important? Um, you know, especially with, with your epithelial carcinoma, there is the incidence of metaphorous disease. So popping up with something else in the other kidney, uh, future chemotherapeutic indications with declined renal function, and that could be chemotherapeutics for urethelial carcinoma, which we know is a cisplatin-based chemotherapy, or another cancer, right? Patients get um, multiple primary malignancies. It happens. Um, other comorbidities that can impact nephrons uh, that the patient may have today or expected to have in the future or unpredictably end up with in the future. When should we do this? Um, this is something that we should be thinking about as surgeons all the time. Um, always, if it's possible and it's safe oncologically and safe from the overall patient standpoint, how do we do this? Um, and that, that has come in the tricky part for, for quite some time, right? Endoscopic ablations, um, you know, there's uh, the endo people um, and have been doing you know, endo ablations uh, for quite some time. Of course, the oncologists have as well. Um, and then chemo ablations. So when we talk about and we look back again, Europeans have, have laid this out. Those patients who are ideal candidates for endoscopic management of UTUC are those that we just described as being that low risk population, smaller size, low grade cytology or negative cytology, low grade on a biopsy. So what do we always have to do in anything that we talk about? Um, because uh, of, of, of what we do, we talk about guidelines, right? And so when we're talking about oncology, um, there's lots of different places that we can go to look for uh, guidelines. But, um, you know, here I talk about the NCCN guidelines. So this is focusing on, on upper tract uh, urethelial carcinoma. If we really look at the top here, we say low-grade disease, uh, primary treatment would be nephroureterectomy with a bladder cuff, right? Plus or minus perioperative intravesical chemotherapy at the time of Foley catheter removal, or endoscopic ablation, plus or minus uh, post surgical intrapelvic uh, chemotherapy or BCG. Um, and then, of course, just like everything in the guidelines, there's lots of, of, of subsets uh, that you have to read the fine print down below, and we'll get into that here. So, First, let's, let's think about those endoscopic ablations and think about what we're dealing with. Um, you know, the number one first thing that I'll say is, is 
is that there is no great uh, and there is no level one evidence on endoscopic ablations for upper tract urethelial. Um, it's uh, based on retrospective experiences and review studies. So here I just talk about a, a review uh, with a follow-up of 24 to 58 months where current rates are high. We know that. We see these patients in our clinics. It's, it's no secret to us. Um, bladder recurrence rates, we've already talked about that, you know, pushing that 40%, 44%. Uh, progression to surgical reception. So after ablations, how many people proceed to end up with nephroureterectomy um, with bladder cough, um, you know, up to 33%. Survival rates are high, right? And so we're happy with the survival rates. So they work, but recurrences uh, continue to happen. And, and that's pretty similar to the cancer-specific survival with this low-risk disease. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the sub part of that uh, NCCN guideline is to use an intra intracavitary um, uh, solution to the upper tract. So, you know, we go back in time and we think, has this ever been done? Can this be done? Can it be done safely? So what's the first thing that, you know, with urethelial carcinoma, we all think um, our minds go to BCG. So what's out there with BCG? Um, you know, and, and people have talked about this. I, I think back, you know, this was something that I had to throw out an idea in, in my, during oral wards as well. Um, but the BCG to the upper tract, curative intent um, with CIS or in an adjuvant setting for TA or T1. Uh, this is a median follow-up of 42 months, only uh, 55 patients. But again, recurrence rates were high, of, uh, close to 50%. Uh, but the struggle with BCG to the upper tract, of course, is the adverse event rate um, is quite high. And even in this study, reported one death from BCG sepsis. So what about chemotherapeutics? That's also a very well-known treatment for urethelial cell carcinoma. Uh, and so let's talk about just our standard um, classic um, chemotherapeutics um, that we've used. So this you know, is a, an early study that just talks about the tolerability and intermediate uh, outcomes for patients who uh, would get a, a standard aqueous chemotherapeutic with mitomycin C into the upper tract. So, uh, this is done at uh, MD Anderson, and, and 27 patients were treated in an adjuvant fashion with about 20 months of follow-up. Um, outcomes are, you know, exactly what we've seen with some of the endoscopic ablations and other things, recurrence-free survival, 60%, progression-free survival, 80%, um, avoided a nephroureterectomy in 76% of patients, and cancer-specific mortality um, and overall survival in both uh, both quite good, um, and uh, they did report nine adverse events related to the uh, intervention and installation itself and not in episodes of systemic uh, toxicity. So if we go back to our guidelines, um, now it's 2022, and they say this chemotherapy, right? We just showed it's, it's hard. Results are not much better than it's been for endoscopic ablations. And we look at that fine print uh, down below guidelines, um, you know, there's paragraphs under each of the guidelines of where they are. And we, we look at this mitomycin, the literal gel or upper tract gel application uh, for those patients with low grade, low volume disease in the upper tract. So what is that? Uh, chemo ablation or adjuvant therapy, you know, uh, it's, it was approved in April of 2020. Um, we're in the middle of the, the pandemic at that point in time. Uh, that's the Olympus trial, um, and that's mitomycin or the pilocalaceal solution or UGN 101. It gets approved by the FDA based on a single R phase three open label study. Um, and so this is essentially a technology that allows a reverse thermal hydrogel um, installation of mitomycin to the upper tract. So what in the world does that actually mean? It means uh, the opposite of the problems we've had with aqueous chemotherapy. It, it is instilled as a liquid, this reverse thermal hydrogel, then when it, it goes to body temperature, it turns into this gel, semi-solid gel, 
um, that coats the upper tract or coats whatever it's instilled into. Um, and it remains in that uh, semi-solid gel for about four to six hours before it turns back to an aqueous solution and is drained out via normal urinary flow. Uh, this trial enrolls um, 71 patients and, and the drug gets approved based on this. So primary endpoint of the Olympus trial was a complete response, a single uh, look at the ureteroscopy after completion of a quote unquote induction therapy with this UGM 101 or mitomycin uh, gel, right? That's a six week induction course. Again, very familiar to us as urologists. Um, and so we all have these patients. And so we say, well, what did the outcome show? Uh, the primary endpoint of uh, dichotomous complete responders, it's yes or your nose. 59% of patients um, had no remaining tumor. Uh, with a secondary endpoint of durability out to one year with an estimation of top of the at 82%. Uh, big thing that we really need to think about as urologists is in this trial, it did report a 58% adverse event rate, um, not unsimilar to what we saw in that old, you know, uh, Journal of Endo-Urology paper with mitomycin um, adverse events to the upper tract when it was in an aqueous solution. 17% of those being grade three, so requiring a ureteral stent or other drainage. So the thing that always, always comes to my mind um, is primary therapy or adjuvant therapy. So in the trial and in the way I've been using this in my practice is, is if patients have a larger or what we would consider a bulkier tumor, so greater than one and a half centimeters, it was allowed to be ablated down or debulked into a smaller size. Um, to completion or to near completion, patient must have had one, at least one measurable capillary lesion above the ureteral pelvic junction. 48% of patients had capillary disease that could not be reached endoscopically with a laser. So, you know, in my mind, that's probably somebody with, a, you know, in most situations, a lower pole tumor um, or, you know, just around the, cur the, the corner of a calyx that you can't get into with a laser. And in that population, so, you know, you would presume this patient, you know, can't, has no other way to be treated, but except would have to proceed to nephrid redirectomy. In that population, the response rate was also 59% in the trial. So the next question becomes, you know, to patients, how do you physically get this into my kidney? Um, and we all know the approaches to get things to the inside portion of the kidney, and that's the via retrograde uh, approach with cystoscopy and ureteroscopy, ureteral catheterization. We do it all the time. It's a, a daily procedure that's, that's performed by urologists. Um, or, you know, the anti-grade approach, right? Our endo colleagues have done this, you know, for quite some time with, with stones and going direct access onto the stone. Um, and what that looks like. Both of these approaches are approved by the FDA for installation for low grade uh, upper tract. So I switch back a little bit here um, into to, you know, what we find in our own practices and trying to find something, you know, that's uh, finding a niche in your practice and, and where that can be. And, you know, it, it's always nice when, you know, some time is on your side, um, you know, so for myself, where I've recently been in the last couple of years is, is this uh, UGM 101 gets approval in early 2020, um, and the AUA gets canceled, or the live AUA gets canceled, um, you know, and so, so their uh, approach, so it doesn't get out there quite as much, and, and all of this is happening in, like, April 2020, um, and uh, somebody from a small town, Missouri, sends me this, this very large um, patient, for robotic nephrourectomy for low grade upper tract disease. This patient is very familiar with urologists. He's had recurrent low grade bladder. He's had several ureteroscopies. He's had stents in and out, you know, for, for the last five plus years of his life. Um, you know, and I had heard about Mitogel, I've been talked about for, for many years now. Um, and it just gets approved and he's interested in keeping his kidney. And I said, uh, but he's not interested in saying he wants to come to see me every six weeks for me to either take him to the operating room or clinic to instill this via um, uh, ureteral catheterization. So he said, you know, one time a urologist a long time ago uh, lost a stent in my kidney 
and they had to have the radiologist go through my back and get it out. Mm -hmm. He said, why can't you just put the chemotherapy in my back that same exact way? Um, and I said, well, maybe let's, let's see what that looks like. And so I started calling around people, uh, lots of people that were uh, part of the trial with um, UGM 101 and had a history with that. And, um, and came up with some ideas. So I say this in, you know, you never know what's, what may guide you into some ideas um, in your in the future. And to always, you know, you're always asking questions. That's what our, our lives are. Um, and other things you're doing is you're listening to your patients. Maybe they have a good idea every once in a while. So two years later, um, I was able to report our first initial experience uh, in the journal of urology with antegrade installation or nephrostomy tube installation of UGN 101 uh, for low grade upper tract uh, and what that looks like. So uh, I was able to, you know, very early um, treated the first patient in this antegrade approach and, and followed that up and at the time of this publication of treatment. Uh, eight patients and treated several more at this uh, at, as of today. But basically, you know, we report a median follow up of about seven months, right? Short follow up, not not great. We need to continue to follow these patients. Uh, but in our eight patients, we had this um, via integrate uh, installation. Again, I show a very similar complete response at fifty percent as what was in the trial. Uh, and more importantly, you know, I think of adverse events. Uh, we did have some, you know, as expected, hematuria fatigue. I did have a rash in two different patients. Um, and But one patient who did have a ureteral stricture um, identified at three-month follow-up in the mid-ureter um, that we were able to treat with a laser and has been doing fine since that time. So, you know, in, in my mind and thinking this, this is, this is so very early, but it's exciting because I do think there's some potential advantages. With improved logistics, um, our patients uh, don't like cystoscopies anyway. Uh, it can allow you to instill potentially without uh, in-office fluoroscopy and without taking the patient to the operating room. Um, I don't have any patient reported outcomes, although that's that's hopeful in our future. Is I don't have data, but in my anecdotal experience and talking with our patients, is I do think there may be some improved comfort level um, versus having that cystoscopy and, and uh, ureteral access um, via the retrograde approach on a weekly basis, uh, potentially a lower risk than what was reported in the initial trial with uh, complications, most significantly ureteral stricture um, for us. Uh, potential di disadvantages, of course, this is, uh, there's not much literature on this. There's, you know, Three publications, I think, on UGN 101 and the actual patient use data as of now. Um, we're all scared of urethelial carcinoma and the risks of placing in the parostomy tube um, uh, in these individuals. That being said, there are several studies out there looking at even you know, doing percutaneous biopsies. Um, uh, for upper tract urethelial, and I would contend that the oncologic risk uh, is minimal and low grade. Um, and, you know, one thing is, is we don't know what maintenance therapy does or does not look like, you know, in this patient population with this um, thermal gel, uh, reverse thermal gel, you know, technology. Um, and so with a nephrostomy tube, it's, it's very easy to keep it in for six to eight weeks to give your initial installations. But, you know, if maintenance looks like uh, uh, once, once a month on a monthly basis for a year, you, you're not going to probably leave it in for a year's time. You know, if, if maintenance looks like uh, more of a following a SWOG protocol, is it if three installations every, you know, three to six months, something like that. Um, again, not as feasible in a maintenance setting via a nephrostomy tube. So, you know, when I think about this and, and where this has brought me and, and some of the excitement, um, you know, six years into my, my practice is the next steps is, uh, you know, based on some of this and, and just this patient that came to me and had an idea and didn't want to lose his kidney. Um, you know, it's, it's opportunities to get involved and collaborate uh, with people all around the country. So um, become a member of the, the uh, what's now a retrospective and prospective uh, 
new tract registry for upper tract urethelial carcinoma. Um, and I think over time, you know, the more you start doing this, that it does allow you to speak up with your thoughts, ideas, and opinions. And I think that's important for, you know, especially for the young people and the students and everything, everybody in the room, you know, you start showing up to things and then you gradually start speaking up and giving your opinions. And I think that's important. Um, when I think about this in my career, something else is, you know, uh, reviewing your emails, papers that get sent to you, basically everything that comes across your desk. And that's not your actual physical desk, but everything that comes across your computer desk. Meaning, you know, if, if somebody has an idea and they're asking for feedback uh, on a paper or on a presentation, on a poster, whatever that may be, uh, read it and take the time to give some opinions and give some feedback, right? There's not a presentation, there's not a paper in the world that can be responded to that says, looks good, thumbs up, you should go ahead and submit. There's always something that somebody can, can input. So do that in every opportunity. Um, and, and that will, will help, you know, you know, put yourself out there and volunteer yourself um, with all this at the same time. Um, so then flip back to urology, uh, no more life lessons here, but, uh, you know, th this has all been very short term follow up, you know, in the trial itself and then in my own patients um, as well. But what is the durability? And so uh, Dr. Mateen recently, along with many other collaborators, of course, and, and some from your institution, um, reported in Journal of Urology the durability of response. So of those patients that responded or the, they were the uh, quote-unquote complete responder, there's 41 out of 71, about 59% of patients. What do they look like now, right? And, and that complete response rate, um, if you really just look at, you know, you can look at this waterfall, but really at the table as well, three, six, nine, and 12 months uh, we're looking, you know, over in the far right, we're looking at 85, 80, 68, and 56 percent, uh, right, uh, durability uh, with that responsiveness, and um, I, I think those are very decent results, um, but it also brings up lots of questions of maintenance therapy, where do we go from here, how do we follow this patient population, and what happens next. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that Every good study and every, you know, uh, good presentation actually, you know, can end with lots of good follow-up questions and concerns, um, you know, and so when I give uh, a presentation like this, um, you know, I, I'm foreseeing what kind of questions would somebody ask me, and it's all the questions that I would ask somebody or that I ask myself, right? Uh, one thing that we didn't even talk about is understaging, or more importantly, probably undergrading in upper tract urethelial carcinoma. This is a huge implication. Um, we talked at the very beginning about low risk versus high risk, um, and it sounds simple, right? It's very easy to put in some guidelines and say, oh, yes, let's determine where somebody falls in a risk categorization, um, but physically getting that uh, stratification to be much harder. Um, what should a follow-up regimen look like? Um, what is uh, the ongoing you know, rate of recurrence and ultimately progression? What is a maintenance schedule? Should there be a maintenance schedule? Is that maintenance schedule uh, personalized um, you know, for an individual based on tumor size, based on initial responsiveness? Um, so many other things. Should this be used as a primary therapy, an adjuvant therapy, or a combination of the two? Um, what about partial responders? You know, and this is something that has was not done in the trial and has not been done. Um, but you know, one of the things that I think is most exciting of of where you know one of my next steps of ideally to, to gather with some people to do would be those patients who have these quote unquote unablatable tumors because you get up into their upper tract and the tumor is, is hits you in the face, um, can they become now manageable endoscopically and save these kidneys? You know, and I think that's a very interesting group of population to look at. And then the final question is, is 
is this, you know, chemoablation and adjuvants, you know, ablations after endoscopic, uh, endoscopic um, management for upper tract urethelial, is it the new standard of care? Um, I would make the argument that it probably is, um, you know, uh, for this, you know, but there's so many questions here. And we talked about also one of my first slides was the rarity of upper tract urethelial carcinoma. So these questions are really tough to answer and these trials are, are very hard to complete. Um, so it does require so many people kind of putting their brains together and ultimately putting their patients together either prospectively or retrospectively to attempt to answer some of these questions and, and give us some guidance um, to uh, all of us in urology. So like I said, I'm, I think I'm really excited about, you know, debulking of tumor with this chemotherapeutic and, and making it more manageable with a laser, you know, or, or some other in block resection. Um, so again, standard of care for low risk upper tract urethelial uh, carcinoma, right? The number one thing still yet in the NCCN guidelines says nephroureterectomy with a bladder cuff and a lymphadenectomy. Um, but we also said low risk should not equal aggressive interventions. Um, so we need to, to remember to treat um, the disease as it's treat the disease and its known aggressiveness. And we want to uh, save kidneys if possible. Uh, in the staff of ablations, we only have retrospective data. Uh, primary UGM 101 or gel mitol. We have single arm data, nothing in a head to head fashion. Combination therapy with endoscopic ablations with gel mitol uh, within the, without maintenance. Um, in the, the clinical trial, there is you know, patients who have, were allowed to have some tumors ablated down. So there is some data you know, out there on this population. And then we have clinical trials, right? We, we saw in that uh, table though, those have been hugely missing and very, very hard to accrue to in upper tract urethelial. Um, only five, you know, uh, clinical trials in upper tract disease compared to over 250 in bladder cancer. So, um, what what else can we do to to do this? Can we get creative and think outside the box? Um, so, you know, what do I think about this uh, for my career is, is I know uh, just a very small subset of urology and I, I realize that and I think that's something we all realize throughout our careers um, that it's, it's so necessary to keep studying and that means, you know, reading, that means studying, talking to people um, and, and listening to things, uh, talking about your questions, that's what leads to ideas. Um, you know, you're running through this and, and talking about all the things that confuse you about this and, and that leads to your um, to potentially designing a clinical trial. Uh, listen to your patients. I think that's, um, you know, there's the old saying that the patient will tell you what's wrong with them, but they may also, you know, give you some guidance and treatment um, and to just keep going and, and not stop um, in any instance. So uh, in conclusion, I would say uh, nephron sparing is necessary, right? I think that uh, would be considered somewhat common sense as a, you know, with that statement for urologists, intraluminal therapy is now here and approved to assist us in this uh, sparing of kidneys. We have to, it's pertinent that we keep studying ablations and intraluminal luminal chemotherapeutics and the impact of this on our patients. What's that durability? Um, and I think, you know, the final conclusion is, is it doesn't matter, you know, what you're doing and what your interests are and they can change over time, but we can all contribute to urology um, and enhance our experiences for ourselves and our patients uh, in our career. And that is all I have for this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Murray. Um, as I said, it was here a couple of weeks ago, met with a number of people and we really enjoyed her visit. I think this was a, a great talk. Um, I have just one question. Um, besides the guidelines on patient choice, do you have a particular bias or, or, or do you follow a particular path as to how you would treat these upper tract tumors? Isolated yeah. upper tract. 
um, I, I don't necessarily, you know, have a bias. I um, try to be as conservative as possible with patients, um, you know, but with the realization that, you know, one caveat that I didn't put in the presentation that I think is important is, is not everybody can have their kidney spared and not everybody fits, you know, these criteria. And it's, it's knowing when to say, when to say yes and when to say no, you know, to those individuals. And, um, and part of that comes with time. A lot of it comes with that direct conversation, you know, in that uh, management, you know, with the patients. But the struggle, just like with anything new that comes out, is when you don't have that long-term data, it is a little bit, even in practice, um, you know, quote unquote, experimental or, you know, waiting to see and and waiting that follow up with patients, and, and that can be hard on the physician. I think, you can, and it's definitely hard on the patients. Are you still using BCG? Uh, I use BCG for bladder, yes. No, I mean for open track or no? no. Does anybody have a question for Dr. Murray? Dr. Murray, thank you so much for the talk. Um, we, um, when I was a resident, we did a lot of the mitogel, tri uh, mitogel trials, and you know we co we commonly ran into a lot of ureteral strictures, like you sort of mentioned. So I know you said that you sort of looked at the nephrostomy tube. When you do it now, are you primarily doing it with the nephrostomy tube, or are you still doing it with the retrograde installation? Yeah. So. Uh, uh you know, of the several patients that I've treated, you know, now getting close to, to 20 patients, um, which I know doesn't compare to the trial at, at 71 and other people in the country, but um, I've done 80, 80 plus percent uh, via nephrostomy tube alone. Um, I can tell you, you know, uh, you know, I can tell you my own data now um, that I feel that the results have been much better from a side effect profile from ureteral stricture and stenosis with the nephrostomy tube compared to those I've treated, you know, in a retrograde, which hasn't been nearly as many, um, but also comparative to the trial. Um, and, you know, there are groups of people out there looking in, and looking at these first experiences, the first 100, 150 patients that have been treated in the U.S. and comparing um, with a big focus on side effects, those that have treated in a retrograde approach versus antigrade approach. Um, and, and can we make this more safe potentially with nephrostomy juice? Great, thank you. Katie, perhaps you could comment on the failure of European urology to um, approve or the European Food and Drug Administration equivalent to approve mitomycin gel for use. Peter Schlegel asking the question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, you know, I I um, I don't know any of the, the political, you know, backings of any of that, um, but I do think, you know, I, Partially, you know, with it being a single arm um, phase three trial um, may have an impact on that. Um, but of course, you know, a lot of our data on upper tract uh, disease comes from our col our European colleagues, um, you know, and, and how this impacts what that future treatment is and, and what this looks like uh, around the world, I think is, is yet to come. Of course, uh, this is, Mitomycin is not new, right? This is a technology more um, than a uh, a drug, right? It's it's a way to to instill the drug. Um, mitomycin is a semi cheap uh, medication, maybe not as cheap as others, but um, it, you know, pricing has a huge impact on that with any new technology. Maybe you want to talk about the cost in the United States for gel mito. Yeah, so I can't, um, you know, that's that's another great study, right? This is where we come come with all of our questions of what the what the cost of upper tract disease is. There's been a lot of discussion and, and a lot out there now in bladder cancer with financial toxicity, you know, and, and what that is for patients because we're doing all these systems, we're doing all these uh, installations, uh, right? If you 
flip that and say, okay, well, what about upper tracts, right? Upper tracts probably even more expensive. It's just not as many patients, right? Because those patients are going to the operating room for ureteroscopy, which is, is more, more expensive than a permit cysto. Um, the, the drug in my personal experience has been very well covered by Medicare and insurance, but I haven't had any implications, but um, it's, it is quite an expensive technology. You know, I've heard lots of different numbers thrown out there, so I can't give you an actual number um, of what I suspect, but I'm gonna guess, you know, you're looking at $100,000 for a, a course or something. Uh, Dr. Wolfson, you're, um, there's somebody with a raised hand. Um, So, so Katie, this is Jim. I, I, I was just going to ask you. Um, you showed that table where you compared the, um, you know, for for bladder cancer versus upper tract. And uh, where are we now with, uh, you know, this is a little bit of a tangent, but where are we with lymph node dissections for bladder cancer? I think, I think you mentioned that the, the template is known, but, but, uh, but again, I mean, I think, and Larissa was at USC, so uh, there's the the Don Skinner, you know, lymph node density effectiveness. Um, but where are we with that? Because I would just kind of challenge and, and ask the question because do we do the lymph node dissections during bladder cancer or even upper tract just because we can or, or what is the effectiveness data currently? Yeah, so I, I think that's a great question and um, thanks thanks for calling me out on that one. But um, I, I think that, that that's true. Um, you know, I... I um, you know, the, the trial that was, was completed, uh, you know, everybody is, is, is not a fan of, but I think you're, you're right where, you know, it's one of those things we can do it, we have done it and we know how to do it. Um, and so that does push a lot of things. And, um, you know, I, I think that most people in the world actually, and this is just me venturing to guess, Jim, I don't actually know data on this are probably still just doing standard lymph node dissections. They may be calling it, you know, other extended lymph node dissections, but, um, you know, just another implication of a surgical trial and the, the, the close to impossibleness um, of doing that, right? A single person can't do, um, you know, all of the cases, yet there's so many surgical differences, which is, is the uniqueness of, of any any surgery um, that that it's hard to uh, uniform pathway across the way. Then the other the other question I had is for so for upper tract installation of say mitomycin C or even uh, uh, the BCG the, the the I would presume that the dose is about the same, right? I mean, you would think about, for example, one of the, because it's such a rare tumor, it's hard to figure this out, but but maybe the, the high stricture rates are because you're not adjusting or you're, you're standardizing the same concentration. But we all know that the urothelium in the, in the upper tract is much thinner. For example, there's you know, it's tissue paper thin, there's, there's less uh, connective tissue underneath the mucosa. And so uh, I would wonder if that's also a function of, uh, you know, again, I think a lot of, uh, as we were talking about, a lot of this is dogma and you, kind of, you just wonder whether or not there's a, there's an experiment where one can vary the, the dosing. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, interesting, you know, in bladder, we, we just, you know, we just throw the dose in and, and that's what it is. So with the upper tract and the, the gel formulation, uh, the dosage obviously is made by pharmacy and it's, it's four milligrams of mitomycin C per four milliliters of, of installation. So it's actually the first time in urology where we've actually tried to dose adjust people based on, and it's based on volume. So the amount that you instill is based on a measured volume of the upper urinary tract, right? So like in my practice, what I do is every time I do a ureteroscopy now for upper tract disease, I put an open-ended five French you know, catheter at the UPJ and instill contrast into the kidney until it's full, measure how much that is, and get myself a quote unquote volumetric measurement of the renal, you know, pilocalocele system. How much, how much is full enough? How much is too full? 
you know, we don't really know. And that's not something we've ever done. We've never had a reason to say, how much volume does this patient's system hold versus somebody else's system? Um, and I, I think that, that could very much also be an impact on stricture weight, right? Are some people, you know, overfilling the, the system? Are some people getting a less responsiveness because they're underfilling the system? And again, dosage is based on volume, um, right? So what I've found is somewhere, you know, a majority of patients are upper tract holds somewhere between like seven to 10 cc's of of volume of contrast um you know but but does each cc make a difference right I, you know and i also think that a lot of people would say well this data might not be that surprising with the uterine scriptures because we all know what a mitomycin bladder may look like after mitomycin um, you know, installations after bladder resections, you know, and, and, and crippling people's bladders. Now, mitomycin has is, is fallen out of practice in the lower urinary tract. And a lot of people, you know, after the slug trial have, have switched over to gemcitabine. But, um, you know, I, I definitely hear hesitations of people putting mitomycin in the upper tract because of, you know, some of those bladder issues over the years. Katie, hi, Rich Lee. Um, you, you had made a mention about the possibility of maintenance therapy with, with gel mito. I mean, in, in light of, you know, the potential side effects in light of, you know, I guess if you're administering a lot of this antigrade, I mean, is that something that you think is actually viable for the, you know, sort of average patient? Yeah. So I've, I've, you know, kind of been exploring this idea and what it looks like in my patients. So my first initial, you know, several patients that I treated had a very good early response. And I, I gave them their, their induction and I took their nephrostomy tube out. I looked in their kidney at six weeks. I looked in at three months, six months. And even if they, you know, had it, I had some recurrences out at like six and nine months and I would just zap them with a laser. Um, and then I would get the question, oh my gosh, now do I give them reinduce them and give them more gel mito for six weeks should have I done maintenance and so I've switched over and and my new exploratory practice has been um giving people the six-week induction and with a complete response giving them some maintenance and doing it once a once a month a single installation but I've been doing that in a retrograde fashion so I do that in clinic you know with a five French you know open-ended urethral catheter and instill it in the retrograde fashion. And then like every third time, my idea is, is that I do every third time now, I take the patient to the operating room for ureteroscopy. And then as time goes by, I could stretch that out, right? And so then after they get, you know, a year under their belt, then I take them, you know, to the operating room every fourth, fourth dose or, you know, and things like that. How long do you keep it going though, right? The trial. Right. I mean, that's, that's really the question. Like, how long can you keep it up? You know, and I, I, I think this is where this is exciting to me. And I say there's so more questions than answers, um, but, but maybe can also be a little bit hindering because these trials are so hard to complete and to find differences in, you know, maintenance doses or maintenance timings. You know, we've known how hard it is even in bladder to, to show some of those and keep people going. Um, how do you do it in rare disease? Pretty tough. Uh, Jerry or David, do you have a... Yeah, Katie, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. And, and, you know, it's funny, I think one of the slides I really enjoyed was obviously just where you kind of really clearly delineated the low versus high risk. I think that's lost on a lot of folks. And I think that it's important for the residents and fellows to really kind of understand that's where it all starts when you're decision making. Um, I wanted to ask, do you um, perform ureteroscopy on every single patient with upper tract? Or, for example, are you happy with a, you know, a positive cytology, for example, and maybe some of the other high risk factors and then proceeding to neoadjuvant? Or do you think everybody needs a ureter, you know, ureteroscopic biopsy? Gosh, I, I'm not going to be that person that says I always do this or I never do that because that's not true. That's that's always a lie. Um you know, uh, I usually always do a ureteroscopy on people, you know, and, and I make the joke to them and, you know, I'm at Missouri now and I make the joke that I'm originally from Missouri and I'm from the show me state. So I need to look at it with my own eyes. Um, but, you know, if, if 
even if I can't get a biopsy and it's a big, huge tumor, I'll take some pictures so that I can show it to, you know, the patient's family and kind of um, walk them through my, my process. Um, I don't know. What do you do? Kind of the same thing. I think one of the things that I enjoy about treating upper tract is that, you know, with the guidelines as guidelines, you have to realize that there's not always a one size fits all, you know, and as you were saying, you know, we, we try to be conservative at the same time and trying to know when to pull the trigger that, you know, this person's going to need neoadjuvant and then their, their kidney removed. And um, for me, yeah, it's kind of the same. I, I tend to perform ureteroscopy on almost every patient. Um, sometimes I do find, though, that the extra logistical hurdle of having to go through one more OR case sometimes frustrates patients. You know, um, they say, listen, I understand the rationale for why, um, you know, I need to have my kidney and ureter removed. And I guess I understand why I need to do chemotherapy, but why do you need to do this extra thing beforehand and, you know, prep for, for the procedure? And I think sometimes the bulkiness can sometimes cause people to take shortcuts, you know, and I think that that really should be avoided, especially if, again, there's a possibility that they may lose half their nephrons and, uh, you know, if it's not your only chance to give them platinum, I think you have to be very thoughtful about what you do. I think that's a great, you know, a great point, a great lesson, just like you said, for everybody is, just, you know, it's, it's not, I'm not saying, you know, get, don't get lazy and, and stop doing it. But sometimes, you know, it, you do have to just push your patients a little bit, right? They, they show up in there and say, oh, I thought you were doing my surgery today, you know, and you're like, I've never even met you before. There's so many things, you know, that you need to do ahead of time. And, and it's okay to push them a little bit and because you're the person that knows that and, and you appreciate that they trust you, but, um, but you have to do the right thing. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Murray, I have a, this is David Green. I have a very specific gel mito question for you regarding uh, a patient I'm treating. Sure. Um, an elderly patient uh, whose upper tract disease I've been treating just reuteroscopically for about a year or two. She's been resistant to having gel mito, but Recently, the burden of low-grade disease is just, it's really just, it really just can't be managed purely ureteroscopically. So I've you know, convinced her to start gel mito, but she's already developed sort of an upper soft ureteral stricture just from the ureteroscopy so much so that I, I keep her with a stent in between ureteroscopies already, because otherwise the ureteroscopies end up being staged procedures. Right. Would you, I mean, would you have hesitation to give this patient gel mito? How would you modify how you give it in that scenario? Yeah, so I don't think, you know, I, I, it's it's definitely just talking to the patient, you know, and, and um, that risk, it sounds like it's somebody that you don't really want to take out their kidney, um, you know, but also with the implication that uh, it sounds like they're kind of already stent dependent maybe for the rest of her life, but um, that the, the likelihood of being stent dependent based on some of the data is probably pretty high, you know, but, but that's, I, I might push for, you know, and I'm, I may be biased because of my own experience, but um, to instill the gel mito via nephrostomy tube so that you're avoiding kind of that upper tract and avoiding that stricture and not putting, you know, the mitomycin right, right there and kind of going in different uh, directions. So it makes your ureteroscopy and follow-up uh, quote unquote easier, uh, you know, not a, not a good word, but um, more straightforward, uh, but but I have to wonder, you know, and it'd be interesting to see, and I don't know if we'll ever know is is some of are some of these strictures related to the the drug, or is it the recurrent manipulations, the recurrent ablations, the recurrent ureteral access sheets, the uh, you know the recurrence of you know running into the wall of the ureter you know, a, a younger resident or you yourself, you know, time after time um, over the last two years, like you said, uh, more of an implication and then you're adding, yeah. adding fuel to the fire. Do you, do you think that you can put the gel mito up and simultaneously put up a stent in the same procedure or would you, have you done that? Yeah, I think so. I think the important thing before is is to wait a period of time, right? If you've all, if, if you've kind of seen that the gel, it gels up, you know, within about really about two minutes, I think in my own experience, but, you know, they tell you 10 minutes. And so I would um, make sure and I would wait like 10 minutes after instilling before I would put the stent up personally, just to right. it's, it's kind of kind of forward. All right, thank you. 
<clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Murray. Really um, appreciate you visiting us and giving us such an excellent talk. Thank Looking you. forward to your many future contributions in this field. Thanks for having me. Have a good day. All right. Thanks, Katie. See ya. I think we have two more sub-eye talks, those who are going to stay on.